Hi, folks, this is Daniela Camboni, and welcome back to StansburyInvestor.com. Before we start today, I just want to let you know about a brand new event that is coming to Stansberry Research that I think you should check out. The CEO of a company whose software helps track portfolios for 40,000 investors believes he knows the exact moment investors should sell their stocks. He says that it is information that could potentially save you thousands, perhaps even hundreds of thousands of dollars during the next stock market crash. His company uses a technique to help investors track more than $29 billion in investable assets. And now he's revealing the secret behind this technique to the American public. So if you have any money in stocks or own mutual funds or ETFs in your 401k or IRA, then it's a really good event to watch since he gives you details on when to sell your stocks. So if you're interested in the event, you can sign up for free at 2021stockwarning.com. Again, it's 2021stockwarning.com. All right. That said, we are talking central banks today with the Fed uh, saying that, hey, a taper is coming and the European Central Bank also noting they will be scaling back QE and the Bank of England saying they will begin uh, to raise interest rates. Well, my guest today says that this liquidity spigot is a reason that you need to have a gut check on risk. So please welcome back to StansberryInvestor.com, Peter Bookvar. He is with Bleakly Advisory Group. Uh, always nice to have him on the program. Uh, Peter, nice to see you. Great to be here. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. Well, there's a lot, a lot to talk about. Uh, but first, uh, news of the Fed saying that, hey, you know, we should be expecting a taper. We see the ECB also saying the same. They're going to be slowing down QE, the Bank of England. You say this, this is time for a reality check here. How so, Peter? Well, when you look back to 2010, when QE was, was ended, every notable stock market correction outside of COVID and the Chinese devaluation of the one, the modest devaluation in August 2015, every notable equity market correction coincided with either the end of QE, the tapering of QE, or rate hikes. Uh, after QE1 ended, uh, within weeks, we started a, a 17, 18% correction that was repeated after QE2 ended, uh, soon after QE3 ended in 2014. We know that um, we had a, a sharp correction in January, February 2016, after the Fed hiked for the first time in seven years in December 2015. We know what happened in the fourth quarter of 2018 when Powell kept on hiking. So it, it would be hard to avoid a market hiccup. Uh, as the Fed gets into this taper, where to the point that I so highly expect it, because it's the Fed move is coinciding with what you mentioned, the movements of other central banks. And even before this, this taping, the Norwegian central bank raised interest rates. And the Bank of England is, is, is talking about possibly raising interest rates, as you mentioned. So there is, we, we've essentially reached peak liquidity. And, and when you mentioned, I, and, I, and I spoke about that liquidity spigot, even if that liquidity just slows down, that is a different rate of change. And when you're looking at credit spreads as tight as they are, mm -hmm. when you look at equity value, valuations as high as they are, I think just as a prudent money manager, if you're not doing a gut check with this change in monetary policy, um, then, then you believe in free lunches. Hmm. And coupled with the looming debt ceiling in the background, Peter, uh, plus the China growth story, and that's the next thing I want to talk about, is uh, you know China Evergrande and, and, and what that would mean um, for investors on the line. Right, because any, so we're, we're seeing a, a global hiccup in growth that I believe is driven by higher inflation that's impacting the um, the spending of consumers, but more importantly, right now, it's really reflecting and impacting the, the supply side. And there, we, re, we are in this stagflationary type of environment. Uh, that was clear in, in, in PMIs that we saw uh, for September out of the Eurozone, the UK, the US, uh, even Australia. And if China's growth now begins to slow right. because of its over-reliance on real estate, with Evergrande being that trigger, then where the, the, the stagflationary story could truly be, be global. Wow, okay, because basically you're saying if you lose um, the China growth at the margin, this basically doesn't help anyone. This will spill over into the US. Right, I mean, China's economy being 15 trillion, 
and any any moderation and growth there, it's 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 hard to avoid. Mm-hmm. And uh, particularly, um, you know, for those that that export to that market, and we have to understand while while China is obviously a huge exporter to the rest of us, you know, the Chinese consumer is is a consumer of a uh, uh, is a global player now uh, in terms of economic growth, and and I argue they'll be potentially one of the most important global growth drivers over the next 10 to 20 years, just as the U.S. consumer was over the prior 10 to 20 years. So does you think that will hurt talk of, you know, there's been saying how, you know, the Chinese yuan will one day overtake the U.S. dollar and whatnot. Do you think that hurts that story down the line, that narrative? Well, I, I, I think the, I think the dollar will always have that reserve currency status. I, I, it's, it, to me, it's, it's virtually impossible to dislodge it. The question is, is who who can potentially join it? And yes, I do think over time that when you look at like sort of the market share of global transactions, the market share of central bank reserves, the dollar market share will continue to decline, but still will maintain the largest share. Uh, and, and what's happening in China, you know, th- th- there are pluses to what's, what's going on with Evergrande in the sense of, of trying to sort of reduce this moral hazard, the reduce this ability that the Chinese government is always going to bail you out. Now, they're going to bail out the individual who invested in the wealth management product or who uh, bought an apartment uh, before it was even built. Uh, they will either get their money back or eventually their delivered apartment uh, as other developers finish these projects. But in terms of reckless lending from a bank standpoint and, and other uh, bondholders that lent uh, these 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 properties uh, money and these developers money, uh, I, I think that um, you know bankruptcies cleanse bankruptcies should be viewed as a good thing. Obviously, good, not good for those that are getting hurt by it, but good from the standpoint of let's not be Japan. Let's not, just not constantly bail out everyone uh, and teach no lesson and 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 socialize these losses. So, Peter, talk to me now about sectors uh, that are looking uh, uh, hot to you uh, within this financial context then. Well, counterintuitively, if China slows, there's a belief that, okay, I need to sell my commodities because they're economically sensitive. Uh, I'm bullish along the less economically sensitive commodities, like energy, which I think the supply side uh, is falling to such an extent that any crimp in demand, if, if global growth slows down, will not be enough to offset that supply slowdown. Uh, agriculture, people are still going to eat. There's still going to be an increase in the global demand for food just as the global population rises. So in agriculture, it's really getting the supply side right. And I still think that the supply is not going to keep up with the demand. I still remain bullish on precious metals. And when you're looking out you know, over a multi-year time frame, even over the hump of any slowdown in China and what that means to the rest of the world, I still think uh, valuation-wise and growth-wise, uh, Asian stock markets are really attractive looking out over the next five to 10 years. And lastly, you know, I remain a bull in precious metals. Well, uh, to that point, I love a recent tweet of yours where you basically admit, hey, I'm a sadomasochist uh, for being a bull in long gold and silver, uh, but basically you, you know it's time will come one day. Uh, talk to me a little bit about that, Peter. It's, it's, it's painful. You want it above 2000. So uh, I've been in the inflation story since uh, the spring of last year when supermarket shelves uh, were depleting because of the rush to supermarkets and the supply setting side getting completely disrupted because of COVID. I thought that that was noteworthy and potential dress rehearsal of, of supply problems that would persist and it's definitely played out. So after a good year in 2020, where gold was up 20% plus, silver was up 40% plus, I thought that uh, this inflation story really accelerating in 2021 would be the natural liftoff for the metals. But because the dollar basically stopped going down, because real rates stopped going down as measured by the tips market, uh, that, that bull run was, was, was halted uh, as we've seen. But I, I still remain bullish because I think what is clear uh, even from the Fed, where the Fed should have announced the taper at the September meeting and not kicking it to uh, a November meeting, um, that they're going to be really, really, really slow. Even though they, they plan, a, call it a seven-month taper, uh, good luck finishing that 
if the markets get really hit. So I think they're going to be re remaining well below the inflation curve, because even after they're done with QE, rates will still be at zero. We know the ECB is going to be really slow. And even though the Bank of England potentially could raise rates in the beginning of next year, they're going to be very slow. So the inflation is going to run faster than, than interest rates. So if you're selling gold because you think, OK, the Fed's going to taper, I need to sell my gold. Well, in the 1970s, the mid 2000s, and beginning in December 2015, just as the Fed was raising interest rates, gold rallied with a rise in interest rates. I, I mean, Peter, are you are you surprised by the hesitation or kicking the can to announce the taper? Are you really surprised? No, I, I'm not at all surprised. This is a very dovish committee. Jay Powell is very dovish. So they're just doing what doves do. Uh, so what I think they should do is definitely quite different than what they will do. So. And, and just bigger picture with the dollar, because we know that the main two things that influence gold, it's real rates and it's, it's where the dollar goes. Now, granted, the dollar can rally, the gold can rally at the same time, because obviously gold can trade off other fiat currencies. But when you look at the big picture of the dollar, I still remain, I have no idea where the dollar is going to go three to six months from now, or even 12 months. But bigger picture wise, the exploding debts and deficits of the US, particularly the trade deficit, the budget deficit, there is a correlation between those deficits as a percent of GDP and the value of the dollar going back 30 years. And if you think that there's going to be all of a sudden a, uh, a, a, a fiscal vig vigilance in, in DC, then okay, go, go on the dollar. If you don't think that's going to be the case, I still think the dollar is going to be under pressure. Well, if it, if it let's talk to reverse. If the dollar uh, strengthens and gets over 95, let's say, do you think that would have the capacity to rattle the global financial market? It will, uh, but it, it depends in, in what context, because it could be happening coincident with a problem, because we know we've seen in times past where there's a, a global disruption in markets and people rush to the dollar. Interestingly, that really didn't happen with COVID. There was no real mm -hmm. rush to the dollar. The real last rush to the dollar in, in a crisis was, was, was 2000 and uh, seven to through 2009. Uh, and, you know, granted it, years ago, 2015, 2016, we had uh, the, the dollar spike after the ECB went negative and we went full, they went full on QE, but that wasn't necessarily a global crisis. That was just in response to others doing negative interest rates and us not. Uh, you know, just to conclude in, on, on the gold note here, Peter, uh, any forecasts? I mean, do you agree that once gold does get above a 2000 if it gets above 2000 then we'd see a, a really strong bull run momentum here gaining i do uh, i i think that if you inflation adjust the 1980 850 peak in gold you're talking about 2500 uh you know they're, 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 it's tough to figure out magic numbers with this but you know i still think silver goes back to its 2008 and 1980 high of around 50 and, and probably goes past that i mean when you when you just Think about and take a step back, the world we're in now compared to the 2011 peak in metals, the 1980 peak in metals. I mean, in 2011, there was no such thing as negative interest rates. I mean, who, who would have even imagined negative interest rates in 2011? Who would have imagined that the Bank of Japan's, even the Bank of Japan, who's crazy, that their balance sheet would be 130% of GDP? Who would have imagined that the Fed's balance sheet would have been approaching 40% of GDP of what the European Central Bank? I mean, the, the world we're in today from a fundamental backdrop for gold and silver to me is so much greater than where we were in 2011 that it does get me excited about what this bull market could deliver. It's just maddeningly frustrating in this moment in time before we get to that place where I'm still confident we're going to get to. It's just this when you come in every day and 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 gold ticks down because uh, the tenure ticks up a, a, a basis point or the dollar index rises a penny and and some algo sells gold. I mean, that, that that's frustrating to watch. But at least from the inflation standpoint, I don't believe it's transitory. I think it's going to be sustainable and persistent. And I think when the markets wake up to that fact, gold will catch a bit again. That is more uh, sustainable than what we're seeing. I appreciate your thoughts. I think you just echoed uh, a lot of the frustrations of the gold investors out there. Um, thank you so much for your thoughts today. Thanks so much. And again, I appreciate having me on.
Always. Thank you. You're always welcome here on stansberryinvestor.com, Peter. Uh, we'll have much more for all of you, so be sure to stay tuned. In the meantime, don't forget to sign up for premier content you can't get anywhere else at daniellacambone.com. That's it for me. Thanks for watching.